Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Tuesday, December 19th, 2023. It's my great pleasure to be here with Professor David Brady. David, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks, David. It's nice, nice to meet you. David, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? Uh, so I'm a, a JW and HM uh, a Goodman Endowed Professor of Optical Sciences at uh, the University of Arizona. And administratively, where does that fit? Tell me about the Wyant College of Optical Sciences. Yeah, so Arizona is uh, one of um, you know three main optical schools in, in the United States. Um, in the case of Arizona, you know, dating back to the uh, establishment of the Kitt Peak National Observatory uh, and the, all the astronomy activity that's here. Uh, so it's had a, um, a program in optical sciences for uh, uh, over 50 years. Um, and then uh, it became uh, a college of optical sciences, I think 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, Jim Wyant uh, was a, a pioneer in uh, uh, optical metrology, and uh, uh, he was both on the faculty here and served as dean, and then he, he did well uh, in business, and so he, he endowed the college uh, to, to make it a, a named uh, place. And actually, uh, uh, when he endowed the college, uh, there was an effort to uh, to grow the faculty. Actually, uh, Wyant was a graduate also of University of Rochester, which is the other main optics school, and he gave gifts to both Arizona and Rochester to grow their uh, faculty by 50%. Uh, and part of that process, uh, they created uh, a number of endowed chairs. Uh, and uh, and I, I was recruited uh, uh, to take the chair uh, uh, that's named after Professor uh, Goodman, who really was kind of the pioneer of the field that I work in. Now it's JW and HM. Which which of the two is, is Professor Goodman? So it's uh, Joseph Goodman is the, is the professor and then HM is his, his wife. Tell, tell me about Professor Goodman. What was he known for? Um, well, so he, he was on the faculty at, at uh, Stanford, and uh, uh, the field that I work in is, is optical systems, you know, anal analysis of op optics from a uh, systems engineering perspective. Uh, Goodman wrote a, a book uh, called uh, Fourier Optics, which applied uh, harmonic analysis to uh, development of optical systems. Uh, that was, you know, probably the most influential book in in optics in in the last century. Um, actually, like the, the the prize in optical book writing is named after him that, that the Optical Society gives away. Uh, and uh, um, so, you know, he created kind of the uh, optical systems group at, at at Stanford, and that that led to you know uh, all kinds of new ways. He he was a real pioneer of uh, of holography and digital holography and computational imaging. David, I wonder, is there also a an, affi an affiliation with the Arizona Quantum Initiative? Yeah, so the the uh, the, the Quantum Network uh, NSF Center is is part of the is is based in the College of Optical Sciences, and so uh, uh, yeah, uh, Saikap Gupta and, and his group uh, are are in the the same building that I'm in here, uh, and so the Optical Sciences has. Uh, has a, a group in uh, optical physics that's more of the quantum group, and then there's photonics, and there's an optical engineering group. I, you know, probably uh, well over half of all lens designers in the U.S. are graduates of Arizona, uh, and then uh, there's the image science, which is kind of the group that that I'm in. Now you mentioned Kitt Peak as sort of part of the origin story for how Arizona became a leading school in optical sciences. What is it about Kit Pink? Kit Peak. What is the connection, or what are the capabilities at Kit Peak that would help explain this emphasis on optics? Well, um, so actually, you know, uh, uh, Meinel was the you know the founder of, of the institute here. Um, uh, he grew up in Pasadena and, and attended Caltech, and then I think he got his PhD at uh, at Cal. Um, and he he was at you know Xerxes Observatory in in the Midwest and you know I think going into the into World War II you know strangely like a lot of the the major observatories in the United States would be in the Midwest or the East which are not really well suited for astronomical observation uh, and then after uh, uh, the war uh, Meinel uh, led a group at NSF that did a national survey of uh, potential sites for astronomy and, and of course now you know. Uh, the major sites for astronomy are, tend to be in uh, Chile and, and Hawaii. Uh, but uh, at that time, you know, they were looking at what were, they did, you know, national survey where in the United States would be the most suited for astron astronomical observation. And of course you want to be 
on a high mountain peak and uh, um, Kitt Peak came out really well in that survey. Uh, and of course now, because of that, you know, most mountains in Arizona have a, has, has an observatory on top because they kind of put them everywhere. David, some overall questions about about your research. Let's start with your expertise. So all of the disciplines that you're involved in, there's optics, there's physics, there's electrical engineering, computer engineering. What What is your home discipline from either the things that are most important to you, your education, or just, you know, the central research that you do? What's the home discipline, would you say? Uh, well, definitely optical systems, you know, so basically analysis of, of optics. And of course, that was... Uh, um, you know, my, my PhD at Caltech was in uh, applied physics, um, but uh, as a professor, you know, I, I, I spent 30 years on faculty of electrical engineering. Um, but, you know, I, I would say, like, uh, I went into optics because, it, you know, it's kind of, I was, my undergrad was in physics, and optics is like the most applied branch of physics, so I wanted to do something kind of applied, but it's, it's the least applied branch of engineering, so... It, it, uh, I didn't never really fit that well, I guess, as an engineer. So the, the reason I came to Arizona was I'm most comfortable in a in an optical sciences group. So let's tease that out a little bit. It's very interesting. Optics is the most applied aspect of physics and the least applied of electrical engineering. What what does that mean? Well, you know, I, I think that um, you know anything. Obviously, like, like in information, electrical engineering, even though it's called electrical engineering, you know, the the biggest emphasis in it is really in uh, uh, information science and, and, and systems, you know, sort of mathematical analysis of systems. And actually, you know, I, I've been involved in uh, in starting probably five or six different optics companies. And typically when we have an optics company, we might employ like five or 10 optical designers. And for every optical designer, we'll have like 50 or 100 software people. Um, and so that, that's what I mean kind of is that, uh, um, on the sort of system analysis, mathematical side of engineering, there's like unlimited things to be done. But optics is, is you know, very physically oriented. And, and people who do optics can either be in physics or, or engineering departments. Um, but um, definitely, you know, in, in physics, of course, you know, the, the cosmology and high energy physics are, you know, far from applications. But optics is the branch of physics where you, you know, people tend to do real things. And of course, with quantum information science, that's all potentially, you know, becoming revolutionary where, where um, there's no whole new branch where physics could, could play a practical role. Now, are you involved? Is there an optical science aspect to the, the quantum computing revolution that we're somewhere in the middle of? Um, yeah, I mean, most, I mean, uh, you know, if you look at ion trap quantum computing or, uh, um, uh, you know, any of the neutral atom kind of things, they're, they're basically a form of optical computing uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not involved. I'm, I'm a very practical person. So I'm, I'm and actually, you know, my, my work at Caltech was in uh, optical neural networks, like physically how we build neural systems. And, uh, uh, you know, the, one thing about, you know, technology is very unexpected. You never know what's what's really going to take off. But uh, um, I, I'm, I'm more certain that uh, connectionist machines and neural processing is going to be uh, hugely revolutionary technology than I am that quantum information science is going mm, to be Now, when you've been inspired or when you've seen an opportunity to start up a company, what's what's given you the, the confidence to, to sort of pull the switch on that? Well, um, you know, so I, I started the spectroscopy company uh, 20 years ago that, that uh, um, that was really mostly coming from like, a, you know, we, we do government programs, we develop stuff. And after you've developed it and demonstrated that it works, you know, it's very irritating if it doesn't become something that people actually use. So usually it's been that we, we have something that's been working in the lab that we want to uh, transition out of the lab. Um, but, um, you know, my main commercial interest, I, I'm not like a, I mean, I should be, but I'm not a business person who's like, you know, here's a great business opportunity. Let's go do this. I'm more like I'm just fanatical about, um, uh, and, and actually, I mean, the, the work that I've done, you know, the, there's uh, like, uh, I was involved in the launch of Evolve, which is a, a, a security screening company. Um, and that was just licensed technology. It was licensed out of Duke uh, to make a, a security point screening. A screening. I, uh, the, my technology led to the founding of a company called uh, Quadradox that does uh, X-ray diffraction tomography. 
Um, those are all things we had in the lab that you know just got out and, and it was time for them to transition from successful research projects to things that could be used in the real world. Um, but my my passion is just you know, cameras and I, I just really feel and it's it's not really like a there is a business aspect to it that we you know need to sell them to be successful, but I'm just really irritated that uh, cameras are not as good as they should be. And so I, I, the business is more like a vehicle to making sure that cameras become the kind of instrument that they should be. That's why you're a professor and you're not in uh, private business, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose that's true. <laughs> David, everyone's, everyone's thinking about AI and machine learning these days. Is that relevant for your work at all? Uh, it's extremely relevant. Um, the, uh, um, so, uh, um, you know, uh, people, we have, we have two eyes, but we, we don't really ever think that we have two eyes. You know, when you see the world, you see an integrated vision. Uh, that's because you have a, a visual cortex. And so, um, you know, the, the passion I have is to make, uh, is kind of, you know, computational imaging. So we, we do um, measurements uh, from, uh, from instruments. Uh, they actually, you know, they're, they're, there's like, so, so the, the challenge in computational imaging is first of all, you know what to measure, and then how to manage the data after you after you've measured it. Um, there's there's like four eras in how to manage the data. One one is you know make a measurement that looks like the object. So the first step is you know the photograph looks like the object. Uh, the second is make it a simple transformation like a, a Fourier transform or some other thing. That, that so the first one was like you know the dawn of photography until the 1950s. Then the 1950s to the mid 70s, people would do simple like radar uh, Fourier transforms for radar or radon transforms for x-ray tomography and then from the like the late 80s until the mid 2000s um, people would do just constrained optimization where the, 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 it's like doing a linear estimator but uh, applying some smoothness constraint um, but really now with neural estimators we can take data and it doesn't it, it can be unrelated you know you can have like an infrared image and a visible image uh, you can have the time of day in a camera. You can have the knowledge that it's a horse in a camera, and you can combine those in a way that will uh, create a better estimated image. So the this neural processing is is the back end of computational imaging. It's, it's what allows us to think about uh, how we're going to manage uh, whatever data that we've measured, and it transforms what we think we can measure them. We don't need to make the image uh, look like what we want the scene to look like. We just need the data. We need to collect data that a neural system. Uh, can turn into uh, um, something useful. And in fact, you know, I was just uh, working on uh, something this this week where it had to do with uh, um, 3D imaging with uh, with the kind of uh, uh, fringe projection. It's a very complicated mathematical problem. People, you know, there's a long history of people go and solve this problem. And then it's like a student was asking me how to do it this week. It's like, well, why are you bothering with this mathematics? Just collect the data and train a neural network to solve it and you're done. And so it, it changes everything about how we think about we, how we're gonna, we want to manage data. David, what aspects of AI make your work more efficient and what's simply possible because of AI that wouldn't be possible without it? Well, um, I mean, the, the thing that's possible is that, um, you know, that we, we, we collect data uh, from a, a, a bunch of cameras and we create you know, super high. I mean, our goal is to create cameras that are like mind-blowingly better than the human eye, like 100 times faster, 100 times higher resolution, and and that hasn't happened because people just don't know how to handle all that data. So the so the neural processing makes it possible for us to have systems that can create those kind of images. The parts that that, that freak me out is just like you know, um, I spent a lot of time uh, writing you know computer code. And the AI generators for computer code have gotten like stunningly good that you're sitting there and it, it's predicting like the next 10 lines of code that you're going to write. And I mean, it actually, like I was mentioning to you, you know, you're in the optics business, whatever. So the, the things that I make are, you know, cameras, computers that happen to be cameras, right? The, the camera part is like a veneer on the top that the underlying technology is really a computer. The hard thing about computers is generating software and AI generates the software automatically that changes the game dramatically. Now, when you talk about creating computers that are X number of degrees better than a, than a human eye, is like biomimicry or, or bio-inspired technology, are you using the eye as a sort of base point and then, you know, that's your base point to, to make the technology better? Uh, yeah, I mean, we would like to get there, actually. We're, we're still pushing in, in that direction. Um, 
you know, the, the concept of a, of a frame is a film concept. So we, we have the concept of cameras, you know, that you're going to, you know, we're creating basically a new kind of media, right? The, the, you have photographs, which is a still image. A uh, movie is, you know, a sequence of frames. Uh, the media we create is like you collect a lot of data, it goes into a neural cortex and it spits out visualizations that you're interested in. Um, the the concept of a frame is, you know, this concept of you snap, 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 you take a picture. The eye doesn't work that way at all. You know, the eye has a bunch of sensors that are asynchronously collecting data and streaming it out. So uh, we are, you know, definitely thinking on the back end that we want to create a digital version of the neural cortex that, you know, will mimic what the brain does, but do it with, you know, many orders of magnitude more data than the humans actually collect. And at the same time, we want to make the sensor something uh, like the eye, where it's not a, a bunch of pixels that are sequentially reading out data. It's a very complicated sort of embedded neural processor, what they call a neuromorphic sensor that will uh, uh, sample data in a feature-based way. David, what, what level of data are you working with? Are you in the petabyte level, and how do you store all of it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, really, like, last I checked, like 80% of all internet traffic is, is image data. Um, and so, uh, you know, basically, we'll use however much data there is in the world. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we build the... Uh, you know, so I, I led the team that built the, the world's first gigapixel camera. That system worked at uh, like uh, you know 30 frames a second. We we, we would generate uh, um, uh, you, you know like uh, we 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 generated uh, certainly hundreds of terabytes a day. Uh, you know commercially we're selling cameras now uh, that that generate like four terabytes a day of data per camera. Um, but we have proposals to build cameras that will will capture you know, uh, terabytes a, a second. Um, the, the thing that you have to remember about this is that, um, you know, um, when I, I was at Caltech in 1984 when Blade Runner came out, and the Blade Runner has this scene, you know, where, where you know, Harrison Ford talks to the computer and says, you know, enhance, enhance, enhance. Um, most of that scene has come to true. You know, you can talk to computers now. Actually, he was on a CRT. We have much better displays, and he asked for a hard copy. We would never do that now. Um, but the uh, um, the this ability to zoom in indefinitely is something that we're 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 still working on. But since that time, actually, you know, I was at Caltech. Um, we were using IBM PCs, and they, they weren't like PC clones. They weren't like something. They they were the actual first IBM PCs, and you know, we had floppy disks. Since that time, you know, for the price of what a floppy disk was then, uh, you can buy a terabyte thumb drive for about the same price. Um, so, you know, the price of memory is down by a factor of a billion. Uh, the, the price of communications is also down by like a you know, million or so. Communicate computing is up by like a factor of a million. Uh, but cameras are kind of about the same. Um, and so that's what we're trying to change is definitely make it so that uh, you know, the, the, you know they, people talk about this information apocalypse where like within 50 years, like every atom on earth will be necessary to store all the data that we've generated. Um, we're, I guess we're trying to drive that. <laughs> David, in thinking about these exponential advances, is, is Moore's law a useful frame of reference for you? Is it still relevant? Are we still, you know, pushing the boundaries of Moore's law? Definitely. Um, the, the, uh, um, when I when we built the Gigapixel camera, um, one of the motivations was that people said, "Well, Moore's law doesn't apply to cameras because the the sensor is already at the wavelength scale." Um, but the sensor is just a really extremely small part of a camera. Most of you know, the, like in a standard compression algorithm, every pixel in a camera gets touched like a hundred times after it's read. Uh, so so like ninety nine percent of the power in a camera is not the sensing; it's the information processing after. And so basically, you know, yeah, we, we, we have unlimited demand for, you know, the, 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 the limitation to what cameras can do is really not optical. It's like, how do you manage all that data and make it easy and convenient for people to get whatever information that they want? And so um, definitely like, like neural processing has changed everything because the architecture, you know, ba basically neural processing is just a continuation of the trend to make computing more and more parallel. Um, and um, so being able to, process more data like like right now uh we a metric i think about a lot is like uh, what's the energy cost per pixel uh, like and right right now it's about a nanojoule so like one nanojoule is of energy is expended for every pixel detected 
to get to where we would sense, you know, all the information you might want to sense, we would need to drive that down by a factor of a, a million or so. And that will happen through uh, continuing advances in, in uh, processor architecture, which is effectively Moore's law. David, some questions about the users of the technology that you create. So are you one of your own users? Do you use these cameras to conduct fundamental research on your own? Or is it really for others to, to do that? Uh, yeah, I don't really. I mean, I, I'm a photographer. I like to take beautiful pictures. And I, I, I have a dream of, you know, like in retirement that I would do nothing but go take pictures. But I can't retire because I don't like any of the cameras that are available right now. <laughs> the... Uh, um, but when when you talk about like like uh, so yeah people have different interests and uh, my interest is in how to make cameras and make things you know sense information so like like you know I've been to a lot of the famous telescopes in the world and uh, when I when you get up there people will start talking about all the wonderful things they're seeing in space and I'm always like I just really don't care I just want to talk about the instrument and the telescope and uh, and I'm that, I'm that way with and I, I think definitely in photography obviously. Uh, people who create media are artists and are going to do um, um, amazing things. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I'm just interested in the, the technical challenge of building. It's, it's a similar, I think, to like a computer designer, right? You, you don't expect a computer designer to, to design all the algorithms that are going to be interesting on a computer. And so I'm more interested in let's make a this amazing instrument and then I would empower other people to go take pictures with it. All right, so now let's go to the end users from the largest scale to the smallest scale. So obviously we'll start with the universe, astronomers. Where do we see your technology in, in, in telescopes and other imaging devices? Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, basically my, my interest is in making super wide field, uh, you know, like, like high information capacity. Normally with telescopes, they get bigger, they get higher resolution, but but the uh, um, the information capacity stays about the same. You know, cameras all tend to be about 10 megapixels because it's possible to design lenses that can sam sample 10 megapixels. So uh, we've done telescope designs uh, that uh, are you know compact, super wide field, so they're not higher resolution than other telescopes, but they they can see the entire sky all the time. Uh, and you know currently I have some. Uh, you know, space debris tracking projects where we build telescope arrays that can, you know, kind of survey the whole sky continuously. And then from there, what would be next on the scale? What's next down from astronomy in the universe? Atmospheric testing, planetary science? Um, I mean, we, 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 we do uh, uh, work on those kind of things, but uh, I mean, a lot of what I work on is, uh, uh, you know, uh, military oriented projects like, you know, uh, Earth, sur Earth surveillance, um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, like putting on drones and planes. And, you know, to basically, like, like for a drone, you know, the cost of an aircraft is really flight time. And so if we can put cameras that will see more on a, on a, on a uh, aircraft, then, you, you know, you, you can get more information per unit flight time. So I imagine then that there are some aspects of your work that require a clearance and you can't talk about them. Um, well, um, definitely I work with people who, uh, who have a clearance and, and I have had one uh, before, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, then I worked in China for quite a while. So, so then uh, I had to get out of the, that, that secure game, but definitely uh, we, we build keep cameras again. Actually, I don't care what the cameras look like, you know, so I build cameras for people who use them for stuff that they don't tell me about. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then now at the smallest level, where do we see your cameras that are relevant for, you know, molecular or atomic level study? Um, well, um, the, I mean, at the, at the atomic level, you know, I, I work in computational imaging. So the, the general methodology that I that I work on uh, has been applied, you know, to, uh, for X-rays and, uh, um, uh, you know, mass spectroscopy and all kinds of instruments. Because, you know, basically we've developed a methodology about how you go about um, building a forward model, you know, describe physical description. You know, basically, the, the core problem is the real world is continuous. Measurements are discrete. We sort of get into the details of how you build that interface and build computation around it. So that's been applied in in uh, in these X-ray systems and uh, and in mass spectroscopy. Um, the uh, um, and then then there, there's stuff like uh, um, there's a guy uh, um, this kind of a uh, uh, Rourke uh, Horsmeyer um, was a, a graduate student, an undergraduate student in my lab at, at Caltech, started working on computational imaging. Um, 
And then uh, uh, I mean, that was at Duke. He was an undergrad in my lab at Duke. Uh, but then he got his PhD uh, uh, with, with Chang Wei uh, Yang at, at Caltech. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of developing uh, uh, Fourier tachography, which is like a gigapixel sort of microscopy system. And now he's on the faculty at, at Duke and has built a kind of uh, scanning gigapixel microscope at, at Duke using the same kinds of technologies. David, is it useful to think of your research as having both classical and quantum applications? Well, um, I mean, optics, I mean, the, the beauty of optics is, you know, that, that's basically the definition of optics is kind of where electromagnetic theory and quantum theory collide. Uh -huh. You know, the, the definitely you, you need to understand, you know, quantum mechanics to understand uh, optics. Uh, but in, in my case, uh, um, I, I sweep most of the quantum aspects under the rug by we, we have uh, statistical models for the field um, that, that uh, describe most of the quantum mechanics in a kind of simple way. So uh, definitely people in this area in quantum in optical imaging can get into uh, uh, quantum limited detection. Uh, but actually, that, this is one of the things that, that where I diverge from uh, quantum computing is uh, I'm mostly interested in kinds of systems where the data is massive, you know, where we're going to collect gigapixels, terapixels, that kind of thing. And uh, when, when you get to this massive data scale, uh, you just don't have that kind of interface in a quantum system. Some more technical questions, some terms of art in your field. Aperture synthesis, what does that mean? Uh, ab, ab, so uh, an optical system's resolution is, is limited by, uh, by uh, you know, the aperture size of the lens. You get a bigger lens and you can, you can uh, you, the, basically there's a diffraction theory that says you would, you would see more. Uh, aperture synthesis is phasing multiple apertures to behave as a single aperture. Um, so when you see something like you know the very large array of tele you know, radio telescopes in in New Mexico, you you would collect data coherently from those radio telescopes uh, to combine them to to get uh, uh, a a bigger effective aperture. Uh, people do the same thing with optical telescopes. You know where where they can build interferometers between multiple optical telescopes. And uh, and interferometrically combine their data to to create a, a larger synthetic aperture than what you have from any one of the ind individual instruments. Does a larger aperture is there a challenge there with with frame speed? Is it slower the larger it is? Is that a technical challenge to overcome? No, um, I mean the, 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 so a, a, a larger aperture. Typically, what people do is they make the aperture bigger, but they'll make the field of view smaller so that the 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 the, the frame speed would stay the same. Um, but yeah, the, the one of the things that we have emphasized doing is uh, um, not doing that, making the aperture bigger and and keeping the field of view up. Uh, in which case, the the data load uh, becomes larger and larger, and so then then how you're going to manage and compress all that data becomes an issue. What is the what is the value of applying interferometries or techniques from interferometry for your work? Um, well, again, for you know, basically it it allows us to uh, create a, a larger effective aperture. Uh, definitely, you know, you know, we we also use interferometry uh, to uh, um, see through turbulence, see through the atmosphere. That you know, we, we with interferometric techniques uh, we can. Uh, um, uh, computationally uh, process the field in ways that, that you can't really do with just a lens. Now you mentioned the phrase artificial neural network. What is its relation to a quote unquote a real or a biological neural network? Well, I mean, you know, biological neural network, you know, is, uh, is a bunch of cells that are connected uh, uh, through, uh, you know, axons and all kinds of complicated chemistry. Um, so a well, an artificial neural network is a, uh, um, uh, you know, is a is a mathematical structure that's loosely based on the on the biological version, um, but it, it's a connectionist machine. So it, it's it's a machine where, uh, you know, there's there's a, you know, computers classical computers are built from logic gates, um, but a, a artificial neural network, the 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 basic computational tool is what's called a perceptron. It's a a weighted you know vector matrix multiplier that. Uh, combines a bunch of weighted values and puts them into a threshold. Um, I think, by the way, my, my PhD thesis at Caltech was, was one of the first PhD theses to use the term artificial neural network. Oh, wow. And it, it uh, um, the thesis was uh, a volume holography and artificial neural networks. That was in uh, 1990. And, you know, Caltech had just started this computation and neurosciences uh, division and, uh, you know, it was, it was, 
it, was, it looked to be good times, and then the 90s were kind of a dark era for that. But optics was relevant to this artificial neural networks because uh, uh, optics, you know, you basically in an artificial neural network, you have a, a bunch of signal values, which you think of as the outputs of neurons. You need to implement a, a linear sum of those things and then put them into a threshold. Uh, electronics is not very good at doing linear sums of, of values because you have the impedance and, uh, you know, uh, interface issues, uh, where optics is, is very naturally a very powerful way to do these kind of connections. So, you know, it's, in this case, you know, using an optical device to combine a bunch of things and get an output is, you know, extremely different from what happens in a, in a, in a, in a biological brain, but mathematically a kind of similar thing. Now, you mentioned, you know, the ways that cameras can now be hundreds of times more impressive than a human eye. And then you just likened, um, you know, a brain for a neural network with a computer in artificial neural networks. Can we start to think about computational power as as being in the same ranks as a human brain in terms of what a human brain can do? Um, yes. I mean, I think that's a really, really interesting question. Um, in terms of like raw numbers of calculations, current electronic machines are, you know, much faster than anything that happens in the human brain. So already, I mean, the, the, the raw processing power is, is more than the human brain. Um, you know, I think there, there's people now that are sort of debating whether, you know, chat GPT and, and um, you know, the, the, these platforms are sentient or not. I think they're, they're, they're you know, I mean, some of what it shows is just most of what humans do is kind of superficial. Um, but you're actually, you know, the, the funny thing about like human intelligence is that it's kind of a small part, even of what the human brain does, right? It's, it's much harder to make a machine that can walk around and, and pick up things and, and eat and do all the, the things we do naturally than it is to make a machine that can think of what the way we think of uh, thinking normally. Um, so, uh, um, but um, yeah, the, the, I mean, you know, the, these, these machines that are currently, you know, ChatGPT is a massive computational system with like, you know, a trillion lines of code. Um, but uh, in the same sense that, uh, um, you know, computation has gotten a million times faster over the course of my career. Uh, definitely, I think these neural systems are going to get a million times more efficient in the next 30 or 40 years. And um, I think almost certainly we'll have machines that are, you know, much smarter than humans. And then what about tomography? What role does tomography play in your work? So uh, tomography just means uh, it, it, it's Greek for slice selection, right? The graphic is imaging and tomo is uh, measuring slices. So it just means uh, multi-dimensional imaging. Um, we think of imaging as not tomographic just because it came from this era where images were formed, you know, on, on planes. Um, and so actually almost all imaging is, is tomographic because uh, the, you know, the real world is not two dimensional. It's, it's three, four or five dimensional. And so um, in what I do, computational imaging, um, there's a, um, there, there's kind of three major revolutions. Um, one, one is uh, um, this recognizing that the world is multidimensional. And uh, so, you know, I've kind of like sequentially gone through all form, different forms of tomography and done what's called uh, compressive tomography, where, where uh, traditionally people think like if, if I have a two-dimensional measurement, the, the, the core problem is measurements are usually on a two-dimensional plane and the object is usually higher dimension. And so, like, if you look at um, uh, uh, X-ray tomography, people have these round gantries, and they, you have to spin around the object to form a three-dimensional image. Uh, we've gone through all these different forms of tomography and developed uh, ways to do snapshot tomography, where we we we, can, we don't have to give up time; we can reconstruct multi-dimensional objects in a in a single snapshot. Um, and so that you know, hyperspectral imaging is a form of tomography where you have XY planes in color. Uh, video is a form of tomography with XY in, in time. Uh, so computational imaging is about ways to estimate the multidimensional objects from lower dimensional measurements. Uh, the second aspect of, of that is uh, um, that traditionally, you know, when, when you take a photograph, it's a photograph of the light field. It's not a photograph of the object. Uh, computational imaging really and really computational tomography focuses on we don't want to image the field, we want to image the object. So that's it. Then we talk about what neural systems allow, they allow us to do that. We don't form an image of the light that happened to be generated from the object, we form an estimate of the actual object. And then the, the third aspect is just this, this aspect of uh, 
information quality, quantity, you know, that, that uh, traditionally systems have been uh, really limited in the amount of information they can collect and by being clever about ways that we manage the data coming off these things and implementing uh, real-time compression in neural systems, uh, we can increase the amount of sensed information by many orders of magnitude. Dave, of course, all of this technology, all of these capabilities, it must be quite expensive. What are the key sources of funding, both you know, government and perhaps private enterprise that make all of this possible? Um, well, you know, so my work has historically been funded mostly by the uh, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. Um, so, you know, we, we built a variety of kind of advanced checkpoint technologies for Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we, uh, you know, currently uh, we have a project to build a pilotage system uh, for the uh, uh, Apache helicopter. So, you know, we're, we're building kind of high-end uh, uh, military uh, imaging systems. And, of course, the work on the gigapixel camera was funded by uh, by DARPA. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, I mean, in, in, this, in this space that I work in, you know, a lot of people work in uh, biomedical kinds of imaging, and so their work's funded by NIH. Uh, I, I've kind of avoided learning any biology, so I, I, I tend to work on, on military-oriented things. But um, I think that, you know, now, of course, um, you know, the major imaging companies in the world are the cell phone companies. So, you know, the graduates of my group, about a third work for, uh, you know, either Samsung or Google or, or Apple. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, Meta, you know, is, is investing heavily. So. It, Apple, you know, is is made a big bet around the concept of spatial computing, that, and I think in general there's an emphasis around uh, how these technologies change the way we interact with the, the world around us. And actually, here at Arizona, we we have a program called uh, uh, Oasis. It's on the, uh, the human augmentation and and combining advanced sensing and uh, um, and and interactive displays. So basically, very much in line with like uh, Apple's concept for spatial computing and Meta's concept for the the metaverse and you know that that work is uh, funded a lot by uh, um, you know big tech and, and corporate interests well David let's go back now establish some personal history when you were an undergrad at McAllister were you already thinking about optics and photography and and electronics or that that comes later on at Caltech yeah no um, so uh, I was an undergraduate and uh, um, I, I studied uh, physics, and, and my undergraduate thesis was on, uh, you know, dark matter and, and cosmology. Uh, and uh, and you know, at McAllister, uh, uh, we had like a little, you know, tiny little particle accelerator. It was more like an ion implant machine, but it, we thought of it as a particle accelerator. And but the guys were really tied in with the guys at University of Chicago. So that you know, that summer I was senior, we went down and and we you know uh, visited Fermilab and and and. I could just, I, that wasn't for me. I, I'm not, I didn't want to work in a group of like a thousand people working on these huge physics projects. And so I knew I wanted to do something uh, applied. Uh, and actually, so, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, Caltech had this applied physics program was a real attractor at Caltech because I wanted, I, I didn't go into pure physics. I went into, you know, the applied physics program. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would, I would say that um, optics was like the only thing I could do because I, I, didn't know electronics and I, I didn't know I did know and understand waves you know and I, when I when I got to Caltech um, I took uh, quantum optics or quantum electronics with Amnon Yariv and you know he talked about uh, you know how uh, um, he got into optics because he likes waves and he was like a body surfer and stuff and uh, that really resonates with me as well that that uh, I you know electrical engineers like to think in like equivalent circuits and I, I'd never have liked that I, I like to think in terms of waves so the term applied physics, how did you understand that as a as an attraction point to coming to Caltech? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I really knew what it was. You know, I, I actually, I, I, I wanted to do, uh, at the time when I was a, a senior in, 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 in college, there was a, a Scientific American article on, opti on optical computing, and, uh, and that looked interesting to me. And so... Uh, um, and and to be to be honest, um, you know, I, I was an undergrad at McAllister in Minnesota. So number one, I had to get out of the north. You know, I, I was going to go to California any way you looked at it. And uh, so I was really choosing between uh, uh, Stanford and, and Caltech. And uh, um, uh, my my girlfriend at the time, who's, who's now my wife, um, I, 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 we met at undergrad, and uh, I thought she was going to go to UCLA. 
Uh, and so I went to Caltech, and then she ended up going to Berkeley. But, yeah. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, kind of everything worked out in the end. Yeah. Tell me about the course of study when you got to Caltech. What what were the what were the key courses for you to take? Um, well, I mean, the, you know, I, I took uh, the, the main most influential course was taking 4A optics from Goodman's book, but uh, taught by uh, Dimitri Saltis. Uh, and um, so that that was like the most influential course in, in, in my uh, career. You know, I also took, you know, the, the basic, uh, you know, quantum optics or, or, you know, quantum mechanics and uh, uh, electromagnetic theory and, and uh, um you know, and then I, I, I sat in a little bit of uh, five minutes time was teaching a course on, you know, fundamental elements of computation. And uh, Carver Mead was was teaching, uh, um, uh, you, know, you know, like uh, uh, neural processing and, and electronic design. Both those courses I'd, I'd sat in, but I didn't uh, didn't register for. Um, I would say, by, by the way, so, you know, later in life, you know, I, I was on the faculty at, at uh, Illinois where we would get a lot of uh, Caltech undergraduates. And uh, uh, Caltech had a reputation for people taking esoteric stuff and not really learning the basic stuff. And I think that was true of my experience as well. You know, I took a bunch of really kind of esoteric, wild ideas at Caltech, and uh, we didn't spend that much time on kind of, the, you know, here's basic theory. Who ended up being your thesis advisor? Uh, Dimitri Saltis was, was my thesis advisor. And he, so he, um, you know, he was a real pioneer of optical neural processing and, and optical computing. And so, you know, knowing that I wanted to do optical computing, I, I um, went and talked to him and he allowed me to join his group. So tell me, in what ways was he a pioneer? What did he do? Well, um, you know, so actually, you know, his, uh, um, he, he was, a, he came from uh, Carnegie Mellon where uh, his advisor was this guy, uh, Cassisan, who had pioneered a lot of ideas of uh, optical processing using uh, uh, CCDs, you know, c uh, optical electronic sensors really kind of new then, and people were using them for for analog uh, processing of, of, of data. Um, but um, uh, Saltis and a guy, uh, Nabil Farah, uh, were, were kind of the first people to recognize that uh, if you were going to build a connectionist machine like a, uh, a, a neural processor, that building it in optics would, would be the most efficient way to do that. Um, it, but and, and you know, since that time, you know, uh, um, you know, Saltus has done all many, many amazing things. Where you know, he worked on uh, 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 optofluidics, and and the neural work that I worked on ultimately became a basis for uh, uh, building uh, very high capacity um, volume holographic memories. Um, but the the neural processing is now you know popular again, but it's it's never been successful, and it, you know, still optical neural processing is still not successful. So, you know, the work I did as a, as a PhD student, which is, you know, it's good that you do this for research. We, we talked about it was kind of like um, BS squared, you know, because the neural stuff wasn't really working and the optical stuff wasn't really working. And now, you know, like uh, 40 years later, the, the neural stuff is working and the optical stuff's not really working. So I guess it's only BS to the first power now. <laughs> what were some of the obvious technological limitations from your time as a graduate student, both in terms of instrumentation and computation where, you know, you'd have to look way out into the future to see how any of this stuff would come to fruition. Well, that's the thing when you talk about Moore's law, you know, Moore's law was a planned thing. And it's just the thing about, and it's an interesting, it's an amazing thing about technological development that anybody would commit to that. Cause you would think that, you know, companies should rush to do the very best thing. But, and of course, you know, the semiconductor manufacturing industry is off the charts, complex and amazing. And so they, they've got, they go through these stages. So the thing that changed was computers got faster, you know, the, 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 in the 80s, computers were not powerful enough and fast enough to do uh, neural processing. Um, but people were working on it, you know, like Carver Mead was working on neural circuits then, and uh, uh, there's a group at uh, uh, Juul at, at uh, Bell Labs was working on these things. It was a good idea. It would have worked then, but people would have had to invest billions of dollars to, to make it work. You know, they, like we had all these little components and even the neural optical stuff, if somebody came and said, we're going to spend $10 billion to make this work, it would work, which is interesting because, you know, now like in, in quantum computing, people are spending that kind of amount of money and it's not really working. But there, there are much simpler computing things that you could do that would work for the, that kind of investment. The neural stuff needed hardware that was neural specific and people were designing that in the 80s, but didn't really have the investment to do it in a serious way. 
And it didn't take off until GPUs came along and people were able to use GPUs to do this kind of processing. Uh, but GPUs were not really made for this purpose. So it, it's a, and but now of course, now that people understand what can be done, there's all kinds of different companies trying to develop a neuromorphic hardware. David, tell me about developing your thesis research and how that fit in overall with what Dimitri was doing. Um, well, I would say, you know, by the time that, that I was working in, 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 in the group, uh, almost everything that Dimitri was working on at that time was, was neural processing uh, related. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, my, my specific thesis was around um, details of, of how we control uh, uh, connections in neural pro in, in, in uh, volume holograms. Uh, so that, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we developed uh, training algorithms, neural training algorithms that we could implement in neural processing. Um, I, I, made a, I made an algorithm that could, uh, like, use a hologram to uh, translate the written text of my wife's name to a picture of my wife. And Dimitri came and saw that, and he made me do one of his wife, too. <laughs> um, but actually, what I mean, did the was, holograms look like? They're just they're big, you know, block. They're crystals, so like you know, uh, crystal and materials, and they're very, very thick, and they don't look like they're, they're holograms for processing, not really holograms for display. So they they form uh, like connections in in space. Um, actually, you know, at, at that time, uh, um, so the IBM PC was relatively new. So you know, I was one of the first people that really kind of automated everything in an optics lab. So that like the experiments. Everything was controlled with 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 computers. Uh, we had the um, you know the lasers were water cooled, and uh, actually at, at Caltech uh, I got into a lot of arguments with the plumbers because the 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 plumbing would go out and the lasers would fail. So my first experience with video was really uh, we attached video cameras to all the plumbing dials so we could show the plumbers what 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 was fluctuating that would cause the lasers to fail. Um, and so yeah, we I spent a lot of time. You know, automating these experiments with uh, with early PCs, and you know those those things, you know, compared to today, they're like so extremely, um, are, you know, slow and archaic. When did you know you had enough to defend? What felt like a, a measure of finality to your dissertation research? Um, well, um, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, we you know typically research is like three or four uh, projects. Um, I don't, I think that I, I had plenty of material and I, I was more like, uh, Dimitri was like, you got to get out of here. Um, cause I, I would have stayed forever. I was, that was, those were, those were good times. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was, I was like, I'm just going to stay here and work in the lab. And he's like, you know, you should apply for a job and get out of here. <laughs> so life was good at Caltech for you. Yeah. Yeah. It was very comfortable. How big was Dimitri's research group and how collaborative were you with other grad students? Uh, there were probably about 20 or so people in, in the lab. And uh, um, yeah, we were in Steel Hall down in the basement. And, uh, you know, those, those people, you know, uh, they're still my friends to this day. And uh, um, the, we were, uh, I don't know, if you asked them about me, I, I was, I think I, you know, would steal other people's equipment and uh, <laughs> whatever it took to get stuff done sometimes, you know, <laughs> but, but we worked together. Besides Dimitri, who else is on your thesis committee? Uh, well, uh, uh, Bill Bridges, who you know developed the, the original argon laser, and uh, um, uh, Amnon Yariv, um, had, you know, had done everything in the early quantum computing. Uh, uh, John Hopfield, who developed some of the early neural models, uh, you know, that were most popular, then was on the committee, and then uh, Kerry Valhalla. Did you did you interact significantly with Hopfield? Did you get a good sense of his approach to neural networks? I did. Yeah, I, I took a class with him and, uh, and I, I had a good understanding of what he was doing. Yeah. What What were his ideas? How did he talk about neural networks? Well, I mean, of course, I mean, the main thing was that people were interested in then was was how to train a neural network. And so Hopfield had a certain model for uh, how you could create the weights in a neural network. He was very graphical. He used his hands a lot and explained connections. And... Now, what did the job market look like at that point? Did you think about postdocs and faculty positions at the same time? Um, well, uh, that was a, like a mini recession back then. That was the the, the Bush recession when uh, the, made the uh, the first Bush lose the presidential election. Um, so, uh, um, I actually I had talked a lot with uh, uh, Tom Koch, who's who's my you know, the dean of the school where I am now, was like the Caltech recruiter for uh, uh, at that time for Bell Labs. 
So I, you know, thought about going to Bell Labs, but uh, Bell Labs had a hiring freeze on. Uh, and then uh, my number one choice was never leave Caltech and just stay in postdoc with Dimitri. Uh, but but Dimitri, uh, um, you know, showed me the, these, uh, like he, there was an ad for University of Illinois and he said, why, why don't you apply here? Uh, and so I, I did. Um, uh, there were, uh, um, I didn't really think about a postdoc for like postdoc's sake, but there were two or three groups that were doing super interesting work that I would, would have wanted to go learn about what they were doing. Now, was there, um, but, was there a two body problem to deal with here? Um, well, not, not, not too much. My, uh, um, my wife, uh, um, worked at JPL. So, uh, she was on the image processing team at, at, uh, at, uh, JPL working in, in Jerry Solomon's group. And so was, you know, like, she, whenever there was like a planetary flyby and stuff, she was always part of the group that was processing images. So her, her, uh, research was in SETI, you know, so she'd done a lot of signal processing related to SETI. Uh, but she hadn't, uh, she, she was working at JPL, which is, I guess, why life was so comfortable for me at Caltech is because my wife had a good salary. Um, but then, uh, um, when we went to Illinois, um, uh, she, uh, she looked at into computer science, uh, PhD program at Illinois. And then ultimately, uh, um, uh, you know, she works in, uh, uh visualization. So like I, I, you might say like, I, I make, uh, reality vacuum cleaners and she makes things that, that display the reality back. <laughs> Now, what what uh, department did you join in Illinois? I was in the electrical engineering department. Actually, it was it was interesting, by the way, that uh, um, uh, so I, I was in electrical engineering, but I, I was one of the first uh, faculty that was hired into the Beckman Institute at Illinois. Uh, and so, uh, um, actually, I went. You know, from right then, the the Beckman at Caltech was uh, um, it was opened like right when I was graduating, and then I went to work for the Beckman Institute at uh, at, at Illinois. Tell me about the Beckman Institute, what they made possible for your research. Oh, yeah, I mean, Beckman was, well, it, it was, um, it was a huge influence. Um, the, first of all, it was very cross disciplinary, you know, so I was located with a bunch of, uh, a, in a group with uh, physicists doing chaos theory and uh, some ultra fast chemists. And, and so it, it was, it was not electrical engineering. It was all different groups all mixed together. Um, but, um, you know, one of the biggest things about Beckman at, at Illinois was, was that, um, actually, you know, so, so I was hired at Illinois to work on like neural systems, but at that time, uh, I didn't want to work on that. You know, I wanted to do, I, I wanted to get into something more practical. So I went into like a phase of just like shining light on stuff and writing papers about what happened when we shine light on different materials. Um, but, um, in 1995, you know, actually, I, I thought I was kind of unstable because I kept changing research areas every three or four years. Um, but in 1995, uh, I was at a Gordon conference uh, where there there was a talk on on computational imaging, and uh, and actually, I, I kind of thought that um, I was I was so much opposed to quantum optical computing that I wanted to like get optics out of imaging. You know, that I would show that we could do all digital imaging, uh, and so I had an idea for making a a uh, a camera that would be a lensless camera. Uh, and, uh, um, I went to the director of the Beckman at Illinois and described it. And he gave me, um, like $75,000 to go build it. And so that having that kind of flexibility of an institute where people said, Oh, that's a good idea. Just go try it out. And then that was a good investment for Illinois, you know, cause then that, that led to, you know, millions of dollars of DARPA programs down the road. But what's the idea behind a lensless camera? What could you do without the lens? Um, well, this particular camera was uh, um, uh, like a, uh, you know, so what basically what a lens is a kind of interferometer, right? It brings all the light from one point in space to focus at another point in space. But it's also, you can think of it as like a coding element. And so you could think of, well, we'll make a, you know, I mean, you, you might like to make like a phased array camera. Like, you know, with radar, you have these flat panel phased array things. They don't have a focus. They don't point in any direction. They just process the field and form an image. And so uh, we built a version of that for uh, for cameras, but we had to use laser light. So with coherent light, we can build cameras that you know don't have any optics. It's just a flat panel forms an image. Uh, then we uh, subsequently showed that we could do that with natural light, uh, with what's called the rotational shear interferometer. Uh, that was interesting because uh, the most interesting part of it, we, we formed an image that was uh, uh, didn't use any lenses, just processed the light and formed a, a tomographic image. It was an image of a toy dinosaur, and so um, I'm proud of it mostly because it was published in Science. I think it's the only picture of a toy dinosaur ever published in Science. 
Um, but, um, but you know, so lenses, you know, is, is a way to do optical processing. But I would say in that process, mostly I learned, you know, why lenses are so important. So since that time, I've been more focused on kind of joint design of digital sampling and lenses. David, tell me about your decision to move over to Duke. What were the motivations there? Well, um, the uh, um, you know the the the, the dean at Duke uh, was uh, Christina Johnson. You know the optics community is not not very big. Uh, uh, the 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 person when I started working on computational imaging, I was really driven by work by Tom Cathy at Colorado, and Colorado had this uh, had had a uh, an NSF ERC in in optical computing, and Christina was ultimately the the director of that ERC. Uh, and then uh, um, she was uh, recruited to to be the dean of engineering at, at, at Duke. Uh, I was visiting Duke, and you happen happen to show this this work I was doing. Um, the uh, um, and then uh, um, Mike Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, had sold his company um, to JDS Uniphase, and so he had a tax problem that he had to um, you know get rid of a bunch of money. He ultimately gave you know grants to, to Duke and. Uh, in Stanford, uh, so I was part of the discussion that created this Fitzpatrick Center at, at uh, Duke, and ultimately became the director of the Fitzpatrick Center at, at, at Duke. Um, the uh, and and so um, you know it was just an opportunity to uh, um, create a new approach. And again, at Illinois, I was in you know a uh, electrical engineering group, and at, at at Duke, I had the opportunity to create a center that was focused on on optics and photonics. And you know, ultimately, we created a, uh, a you know very big biophotonics group with Joe Isaac and all kinds of great people at, at Duke. Um, and so it was it was that opportunity you know to build a, a new building, a new center. And you know it was interesting, by the way, that you know the, Mike Fitzpatrick was was good friends with Joe Goodman, uh, um, and Goodman had you know been behind a whole bunch of startups in 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 Silicon Valley. And so about that time, you know, I, I met with Joe Goodman, and he explained like the. He was on the board of like 20 years. This was right in the middle of all the, you know, dot com explosion of communications and stuff. And uh, Goodman was involved in all kinds of companies and the future of photonics seemed super bright. And uh, so creating this center um, was was important. What was it about Fitzpatrick's work that was so valuable that he had this tax problem, as you put it? Well, they, he made the uh, uh, name of the company was called the. They, they they made the thin film filters, you know, like for WDM communications, like the the core technology that you needed for uh, making uh, large networks with uh, with WDM communications devices. And what was the mission, the founding mission of the Fitzpatrick Institute? And what would you say was its niche in the in the optics world? Well, you know, I, I, what we wanted to do was exactly this kind of thing that I'm, you know, make, making uh, systems oriented optics, you know, like like things that would be. Uh, um, Focused around applications of, of, of optical systems, and we. Um, but the, but the irony is, you never know when you in academic centers. You know they they can go a lot of different directions. So you know our our focus was on like ultra fast communications and you know the future internet. But in the end, what became the Fitzpatrick Center at, at Duke? Of course, um, you know I, one of the people that we hired was uh, was uh, um, Chung Seng Kim. You know I was involved in bringing bringing him there as part of the Fitzpatrick Center. And subsequently, you know, that became the Duke uh, Computing, uh, the Duke, Duke Quantum Computing Center. So, uh, you know, Jung Sang was the founder of uh, INQ, and so the the, the kind of explosion in uh, quantum in information science at Duke had its seeds in what we were doing then. Uh, and then the other aspect was, you know, Duke became a, a super powerhouse in, uh, 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 you know, biophotonic imaging, you know, including uh, uh, Rorschach, who, you know. Went from Duke to Caltech and then back to back to Duke, and so uh, uh, you know the the idea was to make optical systems like a a, a a big center, but in the end it turned out that you know 20 years later its main things were biophotonics and quantum computing. Now for biophotonics, what are the contributions in terms of health sciences and biotechnology? What are the capabilities that it that it makes possible? Well, I think the most successful thing has been. Uh, 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 optical uh, coherence tomography, so uh, which is used mostly for retinal imaging and you know basically imaging of the eye in a variety of formats. Uh, we also did a lot of work in like uh, advanced spectroscopies, so you can do uh, um, you know uh, uh, pathology and uh, um, 
you know, the, uh, you know, obviously, like the the pulse oximeter has been a, a major feature as well. So, like ways to measure chemistry within the body uh, has has been a major contribution to biophotonics. And then, of course, on the research side, uh, you know, photonic uh, imaging is, is transformative for a wide variety of different things in, med in medicine. David, let's trace the origin story of the the gigapixel camera that came out in 2012. How did that get started? And and if you can explain the the revolutionary nature of this how how much bigger was it than the next biggest camera when it came out um so actually um when when i was back at the beckman institute at illinois like i said you know illinois gave me this seed grant to make a, a lensless camera so then that led to a seed grant from darpa that was like a um you know like a three hundred thousand dollar program or something like that uh, and then that led to another DARPA program. And so in the early 2000s, there were a sequence of DARPA programs around measurement science. And this was mostly led by Dennis Healy, who was a program manager at, at DARPA. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we went from like, you know, a seedling grant at the Beckman Institute to $300,000 to maybe like a couple million dollars. And then we had about maybe a $5 million project to make uh, thin compact cameras. It was called the Montage Program at DAR DARPA. Uh, and after that, as that program was was coming to an end, um, you know, Dennis kind of said, well, what have we learned about all this? What should be the next uh, DARPA program? And uh, so what I what I had learned was that um, we could really push the physical limits of cameras that, that um, you know, a camera, the number of pixels that you measure should be the aperture area divided by the wavelength squared. So if you have a millimeter aperture, you should get a megapixel, centimeter you should get 100 megapixels. Uh, you know, 10 centimeters, uh, you, you should you should get uh, 10 gigapixels. And, you know, physically, we're just far away from that. So I, you know, I went to DARPA and said, uh, this is what I think is the most exciting thing is that cameras should uh, get higher resolution. And, and I, I went and uh, um, proposed this, you know, the, Tony Tether was director of DARPA and um, Dennis had gone and proposed it and said, well, we're going to build a gigapixel camera. And Tether said, you know, well, that's not enough. You should do 100 gigapixels. And so then we settled on like 50 gigapixels, and then in the end we built like a 10 gigapixel camera in, in the in the in the project. But at the time, you know, people were really like had thought of lenses as being the limit of what a camera could do, and and so uh, uh, we were able to show in that program that optics is not the problem. That we we can build optics that will resolve however many pixels you want. Uh, that the, the main problem is this computational problem about how do you manage all the data on the back end. And so that that's been kind of the emphasis since. Now, do you have gigapixel in mind as a as a limit or a threshold as a goal at the beginning of this project, or is it more about just pushing the limits and then you realize that you're in gigapixel territory? Oh yeah, no, it was about gigapixels from the start because yeah, because you know we had this thing where you know people were you know people were talking about megapixels don't matter, and there was like a there was a a staples ad of like the Elvis sprinkling megapixels around on a, a tree or something. And um, yeah, we wanted to go to gigapixels. And then, you know, that's the thing is that um, still, you know, to this day, you know, you, you see now like 100 megapixel or 10, you know, good cameras are at about 10 megapixels still to this day outside of what, what we did. And uh, um, people are making 100 megapixel sensors, but they don't really work actually. Like, like, you know, when you see these cell phones with a 100 megapixel sensor, they don't resolve anywhere close to that kind of uh, real pixel value. Um, and so uh, um, you need to go to this kind of uh, um, multi-scale lens approach that we developed if you really want to be able to resolve gigapixels. Who was most excited? What were the research committees that were, or communities that were chomping at the bit for these capabilities? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think anybody really, that's a, still to this day, um, it's hard to use gigapixel. It's hard to use that much data. I think definitely um, the, the our customer of record was was the Navy. You know, so the Navy definitely has, and the, we we the Navy has use for this, where they have a a ship and you want to see in all directions uh, uh, all the time. Um, but um, and and definitely, I mean, there are gigapixel telescopes. You know, there's there's the LSST uh, telescope and the PANSAT telescope. So I think astronomers, you know, are definitely interested in things where you you know. Like the LSST is supposed to see more supernovas in a year than you know all pre all previous human history ever saw at once. You know because you, if you want to see something dynamic, you need this super high resolution. Um, 
But I would say, uh, you know, we're still fighting that battle of making people understand why they want gigapixels because, uh, I mean, there's a value now that, you know, if you're going to put a bunch of security cameras out, it's better to put an integrated camera out. But I, I don't think, uh, um, you know, we, we've gone and, and created interactive media for, for sports where, you know, you, you can zoom and look, look everywhere. But the infrastructure for people to really use that and, and think about what it means is still in development. Um, and I, I mean, definitely like work is making gigapixel microscopes and the, anything where there's something dynamic, you would like to have this kind of resolution. Um, but um, it's still, a, um, until until we build, develop, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, before television, who was sitting around saying if we just need television right now. But, <laughs> right. Um, um, I, I think when we when we get to where we have, you know, you know, I mean, people play video games, right? And obviously, people understand that they like to play video games. And so if we could make video game except it's real world data, that's something people are going to enjoy. But but we need to keep working on making the infrastructure to where people are really going to understand how to use them. David, what about from like a material science perspective? So thinking about like the revolution of silicon and CCD detectors and all of the advances in pixelation there, what materials were made available that, that made the gigapixel camera possible? Well, I mean, definitely, you know, kind of uh, low cost integrated camera modules. So like, like the, the, you know, the, the, the sensors we used actually were the same sensors as we're going into GoPro cameras. Um, the, the definitely like the, uh, um, the revolution in optics has been the, uh, um, you know, the first hundred years of photography, photographers would all make their own cameras. Uh -huh. you, you, know, you get a wooden box and screw a lens to it. And then uh, for the last 100 years, the standard has been removable lens cameras so that, um, you know, you, um, you, you you buy a camera back and you screw a lens on. Uh, removable lens cameras are never going to be near the diffraction limit. The, 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 the mechanical alignment is not there to really get high optical performance. So uh, cell phone cameras uh, use integrated modules, right, where the, the lens and the, and the sensor is manufactured in, in, together in one piece. And then this allows you to work at a much with much more aggressive optical design. So you, you get a, a, uh, uh, aspherical optics, you get molded optics that, that is, you know, uh, first of all, uses new materials, but is manufactured in ways that's very different from traditional lenses. And then and then you integrate that into a, a, a high performance camera module. And really, that that's a key piece of making gigapixel cameras is applying this uh, cell phone lens manufacturing technology to high performance optics. And then to stay on the, the, the CCD detector theme in the way that that, you know, presented a revolution from analog photography to digital photography, does the gigapixel camera, does it does it still fit in the digital um, uh, narrative or is it something different than digital photography? Well, I mean, it's definitely digital photography, but it's it's more than digital photography in the sense that it's computational photography, that, that the image is not formed like, like, you know, there's a model of film photography going into the digital backs where the image is still the image that's on, that's sensed by the sensor. Uh, but with these uh, uh, gigapixel cameras, uh, you know, one of the things we've done in the last 10 years is really start to dig more into a diversity of sampling. So we have multiple focal lengths, multiple different color sensitivities, multiple different frame rates. So the, the, the camera is just a information collection machine. Actually, like one difference is like, uh, um, you know, traditionally a camera is a device that forms an image, but but the modern camera is really an analog to digital converter. It takes a massively parallel stream of optical data and turns it into digital data on the back. Um, but a you know the first digital cameras were not really like that. They were still basically film cameras with a digital back, where the digital the gigapixel camera is really something that's designed to transduce as much information as possible and put it out in in, in digital form. Uh, and then and then it, it you know there's a model with traditional cameras where basically the sensed image is the same as the display image. So the camera is like a pipe, the sensed image, you show that image with the, with these, you know, digital cameras with a visual cortex, you're just collecting an enormous amount of data. And then you're using that data in a variety of different ways. And for different users, you'll create different visualizations from the same data set. Now, just looking at the chronology, so many of the companies that you started or, or helped to found happened during the Duke years. Was there a strong startup culture at Duke? Did you sort of get involved in all of that at a at a broader level? Uh, yeah, yeah. Duke has a, a. I mean, you know, the Research Triangle is is a great place to 
um, to to uh, to you know do business. And but I would say you know we, we yeah. So I mean the short answer is yes. There is a good startup culture, and you see like you know now, INQ is spun out of Duke, and uh, Evolve was a company that I started that spun out of Duke. Um, but uh, um, I would you know one of the reasons that I moved to Arizona is I think that the the sort of information science oriented uh, and optical de definitely like Arizona is a better place for for the optics business than than North Carolina. I think North Carolina is super strong in health sciences and biomedical in, in, uh, technologies. But... Now, what what has been the development of the Aware camera since its inception? Are you currently building better prototypes, or are you on to totally different things now? Um, so. The, the the aware camera has kind of continuously been my my focus the last 15 years. The, the basically we built you know camera modules that that came out of it. I mean the the image you see behind me is kind of staring down the barrel of one of the aware cameras. Um, the uh, the the thing that became clear through that process was that the uh, computer architecture and the the software was a bigger challenge than the optics. And so but but using exactly you know so now we have like. You know, ten years into development of a uh, array camera operating system, so we we've built the infrastructure that can just manage massive amounts of data and turn it into real video in real time. Uh, and then, you know, I've traveled the world since then, uh, working on the the supply chain for camera modules that fit in this architecture that we can continue to build better cameras. And you know, we're, we're we've been uh, you know commercially selling. Uh, um, Array cameras for uh, like seven years or so, I guess. So the theme you've been developing is the importance of software. In what ways do you need? Are you are you using software sort of off the shelf for the Aware camera, or does this need its own unique bespoke software? Yeah, so we we've developed a an operating system that manages data uh, from from array cameras, and so it uh, yeah to to do real time. Yeah, you know, computing, I mean, uh, imaging is the most uh, computation intense thing that, that humans do, basically. And so, you know, like, like uh, um, for cameras, there's usually a, an ASIC uh, the, to, to manage the, the computational load. Uh, for the uh, uh, wear cameras, uh, we've used an FPGA fabric and we're, we're using FPGAs in, in some of the current systems. Um, I would say, by, by the way, we, we spent a lot of time on on, on the software but the the details of the, exactly the the electronic hardware and and of course of the lenses is critical to the components as well. So you know you you need that little bit of hardware that's well designed and then then you end up with infinite software challenges after that. Now when you talk about a world tour for for supply chain issues, that's all on the hardware side of things. Yeah. Where do you have to go? Why is this a global effort? Well. Um, you know, optics was never really like an American thing, right? You know, the, the um, lenses traditionally, you know, the main lens companies were in uh, Germany and Japan. Uh, and so, you know, this is like, uh, you know, Nikon and Tamron and, and Canon and then Leica in, in Germany and Zeiss in Germany. Um, but, um, you know, with the development of this new model of integrated camera modules, uh, that's basically all done in China. Uh, so, uh, you know, the people who manufacture Optics. If if you want to, you know. Actually, uh, I mean, I, I I shouldn't tell this other story, but but you know, when when you, you when you see the supply chain in the U.S. versus seeing the supply chain after you go to Asia, it looks very different. That the, you can go way up the chain and find out who's actually building stuff. Uh, and um, and and uh, um, so uh, yeah, the, the basically um, optics is almost all manufactured in Asia, and you end up. And it's the same as with you know semiconductors these days. You know that basically. If you once you get into where you really want to manufacture and volume, you end up talking to Asian companies. In launching all of these companies, what did you learn about yourself in terms of what you were good at and what you needed to outsource to others? Um, yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, the uh, um, first of all, outsource anything that you can, right? Anything that you personally don't have to do, uh, you should get somebody else to do. Um, but um, you know, I, I think. Um, it, it happens, you know. I've been very fortunate to uh, to uh, you know have this opportunity to uh, uh, work with Dimitri and understand optical systems and and you know know the, the leaders. So I think in terms of like understanding, you know, what it means to make a measurement and uh, um, and how you manage that data 
Uh, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a, a you know very good understanding of that. But in terms of like, um, you know, I, I think it, it, in terms of like bringing everything together to really create this new kind of media, I'm still trying to find the right people for that. The, you know, we 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 have a great team now, and uh, um, but I've been through cycles of a whole bunch of different projects, and and so far. Uh, the technology that we would like to see is, isn't still still on the horizon, but um, definitely like uh, from a, a business point of view, you know, if you if you if you want somebody to manage a business, you should get somebody who you know cares about business. Yeah, and, moving and, the and definitely, one hundred percent. By the way, like like you know, for me personally, um, I like to be in the lab and play with this stuff. You know, so like um, when COVID came out, you know, I, I was lucky because I had. I'd been living in China from 2019 to 2020, and I, I just moved back to the U.S. When I, I was very fortunate, to, I had moved back right when COVID was coming out. And then, uh, um, you know, I, I lived in a house on the coast in North Carolina where I didn't really talk to anybody for six months, and that was like a perfect life for me. It was... So, the, when you were in China, was that a leave of absence? Was that a sabbatical? Uh, no, Duke has a campus in, in Kunshan near Shanghai, so oh. I, I, was, uh, I was assigned to, to Duke's campus in, in China for three years. Was that useful to you, being on the ground there? It was hugely useful, yeah. It was, it was, it was really, really, really exciting and interesting. And uh, we were, we, I had a, a lab that was, you know, sponsored by the local government in Kunshan that we did all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, powerful imaging stuff. I, I have a, um, I have... I, this is, I actually can't see because I got this background, but on my wall I have a picture of uh, uh, Daguerre. It's one of the first photographs of a person. It's called the Boulevard de Temple that uh, Daguerre took in Paris. But it's a picture out his window, you know, in, 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 in Paris. You know, they just happened to have his camera set up. And that's the thing, you know, camera developers do is you have cameras set up taking pictures all day. So I have like infinitely many pictures of staring. I had a window, I had a lab in Kunshan that was on the 16th floor of a research building in we had banks of cameras set up there testing all day. Now, when COVID hit and you were by yourself, that was a productive time for you? Yeah, yeah. Was, was it time to just think, to get through the literature? What did you do when you couldn't be at your lab? Uh, that's when we, we, we started uh, working on some of this uh, uh, aperture synthesis and uh, um, creating. Uh, so one of the big changes since AWARE, you know, AWARE is basically an array of kind of a conventional camera that sees normal light. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about combining conventional cameras with LiDAR and other kinds of 3D sensing. And so uh, um, during that time when COVID hit, uh, we, I, I, I was working on a new kind of lensless camera that uh, would do uh, aperture synthesis again with, with coherent illumination that we could combine with other array cameras to get. I mean, it was really the, the kind of resolution we can get when we start to get these advanced algorithms and, and more advanced sensing is... Um, Mind blowing. So, so every time you think you fully really understand this stuff, you there's some. And having that time to really dig into some of the theoretical aspects was was really instrumental. Now, in the middle of COVID, of course, you make the move over to Arizona. What what was the interest there for you? Well, I mean, the one the one thing is, you know, sometimes you feel like you know you, you don't so much as work for a university as work for the field that you're in. Right. So actually, like you know, like when when I went to Duke, you know, the reason to go was to create this. Fitzpatrick Center for, for Photonics. And so it, it wasn't it wasn't a service to Duke, certainly, but it was a service to the community, right, to capture this capacity to have a, a center. Uh, and then, you know, the same thing here at Arizona that, uh, uh, you know, I think that I'm, I'm needed here that because, because of, you know, this growth in the, the, the School of Optical Sciences. Uh, you know, certainly uh, I, I make a bigger contribution here than I would at, at Duke. And then uh, Really, uh, um, I mean, it's a stupid, silly thing. But when you when you get old, stupid, silly things kind of are are useful. But um, to have a chair that's named for Professor Goodman is is just kind of a lot of fun. Why is that an honor for you? What does Goodman mean to you? Uh, well, you know, really, um, there's a like an intellectual thread to this community that we yeah. have the kind of way we're trying to build things. And you know, he started that that story. And you know, with a lot of you know other people were involved too, because you know. Um, and I've had the honor of you know meeting a lot of them because the community is I guess not that old, but uh, um, you know it's a uh, uh, you know it's just it's 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 not like the the most important thing in the world, but it's a good good story and a good feeling to feel like this is a community that we're building together. 
Now, did you come with administrative responsibilities like you did at Duke, or you're, you're, you're focused on your research lab being a professor? Yeah, here I, I don't have any administrative role. Was that an attraction point to you, to, to shed those responsibilities? I, I already gotten rid of them at, at Duke. I, I, I was only director of the Fitzpatrick Center for the first five, year, five years or so. Um, so, yeah, that, that uh, um, I mean, uh, you know, the, um, uh, is, my passion is building things and making, you know, so I've built a lot of these companies, but the building the companies for me, it's not about running the company, it's about creating the technology. And, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if it's a fortunate thing or not, but, but like passion for the business of academia has never been one that I really had. Sure. <laughs> we'll bring the story right to the present. What are you currently working on? And more broadly, what's interesting to you in optics and optical systems? So, um, you know, currently uh, we're working on array cameras, you know, like pushing the limits of, uh, you know, building bigger systems to, you know, it's going from gigapixels to terapixels. Uh, and, you know, the, the thing that's uh, powerful about that is uh, integrated neural processing, like, like uh, you know, really even what it means to measure a pixel is, is changing. Like, you know, the, the, this concept of like, when we measure, make optical measurements, we still don't understand the most efficient ways to do that. Um, uh, you know, I've been at this for, you know, 25 years or something in computational imaging, but cameras are a bunch of crap. I, I just got to tell you that they're, they're, they're terrible. And, but I would say like, you know, it's interesting because I, I worked in uh, neural processing in the eighties and it, that was terrible. You know, the, what we were doing were really toy problems, you know, compared to what people are, are doing now. And then it became, you know, now neural systems is changing life on earth. You know, it's, it's up there with the invention of the automobile and the invention of airplanes. You know, it's everything about the life of the future is different because of this ability to, to talk to computers. Um, so it takes some patience. Um, when I started working in computational imaging for the first 15, 20 years, people were like, this is clever, but it's useless. You know, the, the, why are you doing this? Um, but now, um, you know, computational imaging has become central to the way cell phones form images, right? So they, it's, it's, it's everywhere in, in the way that cell phones are, are forming images, but it's nowhere except for cell phones. And so it's, it's going to be everywhere. You know, it, 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 it will make it so that, you know, the, the way we interact in the world is just going to be different because we, we can just ask, you know, like uh, now, you know, chat GPT, you can ask it anything that's ever been written down by a human or ever been explored. But imagine you live in a world where like anything that could be known is kind of known because there's so much, the sensing capability is, is there. Um, but, um, you know, so the, 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 you know, actually the things like, like uh, when I was at Caltech studying with, with what Carver Mead was doing uh, with neuromorphic sensors, that was an idea in the eighties the sensors are nowhere like that now, you know, they, they, they don't use that at all. And so um, part of my passion has been, first of all, to understand the ways that these things should be done, but also understand why it doesn't happen. You know, why, why, when we know that there's better ways to do things, we don't get to doing it. And so I guess in, in this phase of my career, I'm sort of still hoping that, that we'll figure out a way to get this stuff actually operational in the real world. Um, I think so that that's my focus is like, you know, building better and bigger imaging systems and combining them with spatial computing and displays. And, you know, stuff seems to be happening uh, pretty fast in, in, in that space. Um, you know, I think I think uh, uh, beyond that, um, somehow we, there's a huge disconnect in the world that like like uh, where, um, you know, I think that like like the James Webb Space Telescope is such an amazing thing, like it, 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 it it's you know, understanding life at the very beginning of the universe and, and everything. It's like, it's so beautiful and amazing. You think, well, this is like why humans exist on earth is to create something so beautiful and amazing. But at the same time, you know, I, somebody sent me a video today of uh, a whole community that thinks that nuclear weapons are not real, you know, and so how we can live in a world that simultaneously has such extreme amounts of knowledge and such extreme amounts of ignorance is, is just fascinating. Is. And somehow we have to find a way to overcome that. That's right. David, we'll wrap with some retrospective questions about your career, then we'll end looking to the future. So, of course, what brings us together is Caltech. What has remained with you from Caltech? You've emphasized, perhaps, you know, while you were at Caltech, your ability to, to, to surround yourself with people who were really thinking about the future and what it took to get there. How have you incorporated that into to your research career? 
Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, keeping it real and keeping it kind of focused um, has been a real lesson from, from Caltech. You know, I, I grew up uh, in Montana, you know, like a kind of rural uh, and like the idea of, you know, I, I think the people I grew up with, if you want to explain to them, you know, somebody will pay you money to sit around and think all day, they would not be able to understand that, you know. And so when I, when I got to Caltech, um, you know, uh, we just did stuff, you know, that we, 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 we had things and, and, you know, like one time, like these holograms that I made um, uh, were, uh, uh, used these crystals, the crystals were $5,000 oh. each. And uh, um, so I was a young graduate student and I, I sprayed Freon on one and, uh, and it shattered. And I was like, I was devastated. I was like, oh man, I just, and so I went to Professor Saltus and I said, I destroyed this crystal. And he says, well, you know, order another one. And that kind of attitude of let's just go do it was, was amazing. And then the other thing was that, um, you know, we, um, in science, you have to stay honest. You have to, you have to, you know, not believe, you know, not, not overhype what you're doing. And, you know, what, uh, Dimitri did was that, uh, um, you know, I, I went to a conference and, and somebody asked a question and I, and I just answered it, you know, directly. It was kind of like, why are you doing this? And, and he said, you did that right. That was right. You know, just, just, to tell the truth uh, that that was a you know sort of core thing but then the other thing that he did was that uh, when I was in the lab um, I was you know our lab everybody was super smart and we were working all the time and uh, um, and it was real aggressive you know like we, we would argue and stuff and, but then uh, I went to a conference with uh, with Dimitri and he introduced me to some people and he said, well, this is Dave Brady. He's so smart. He's so, and I was looking at him like, like, who are you talking to? What are you, you know, because when I was with him in the lab, he never said anything like that. You know, and all of a sudden you're at these conferences and say, like, this guy is so smart. And he kind of taught me, you know, that you have to believe in yourself. You know, in academia, you got to sell what you're doing and, and believe in it. And that, that was an important, important thing for me to do. David, you've mentioned that, you know, relatively speaking, the optics community is small. How has that been an, an asset for you over your career? Um, well, I mean, you know, it, it's nice that, that, you know, everybody knows each other and everybody, um, hangs out together. I, I mean, it's not like, it would be better, I guess, if it was, if it was bigger. Um, but, um, but definitely, um, you know, there's a thing about, I mean, that's the thing about Caltech and in, 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 in general is that the people that you, you know, like, like, you know, from high school, uh, I'm in touch with a couple people that I knew in high school, you know, undergrad, I'm in touch with maybe 10 people, uh, Caltech, virtually everybody I knew at Caltech, I still know. Yeah. And, uh, um, so, um, you know, I think, I think it makes a big difference in terms of like, and even like, you know, when we decided to do the gigapixel camera, that was kind of a community thing, right? Of people coming up with ideas and saying, what's the next big thing we could do. And, you know, the community can come together and say, this is a way for us to work together to make this happen. Finally, David, you mentioned this this idea before. We'll bring it all the way out into the future that you know we're going to reach a point of creating enough data where we'll need all the atoms on Earth in order to to store it. So, first of all, how do we get that to be science and not science fiction? And even if we're able to do it, why should we do it? Well. Um... Yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's not going to happen right away, right? We, 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 we'll, we'll save a couple of atoms for something else. <laughs> uh, but, but, we, we, but we won't have to give up on the information, right? There's more ways for us to get much, much more efficient about ways we store information that we will have, like, a full history of, of, of everything. Um, that's why, I mean, uh, people have different different opinions of the world. But but uh, as a scientist, I, I believe that um, we don't know what's going on in the world. There's all sorts of mysteries. But this pursuit of knowledge, that's what we're here for. So actually like building things like James Webb and trying to figure out, uh, you know, the universe, um, that's our, that's our, it's that process. It's not like we're going to discover things and we're going to know, but that process is, is what it means to be human, I guess. And it's never ending. There's no, there's no end point where we say we could wrap it up. We figured it all out. No, it keeps getting more interesting. David, on that note, it's been a wonderful, super interesting conversation. I want to thank you so much for spending the time with me.